whatever is in their own best interest. We had this whole discussion in ethics about, uh, oh, I think he just called it benevolence or. Yeah, benevolence. Yeah, like doing something for somebody else with genuine, like a genuine service attitude. You're actually doing it for them, not to get any benefit to yourself or to the greater society as a whole or rewards in heaven, you know, and people that's, were, people were Aris saying. Remember Aristotle said generosity mm -hmm. is uh, the two political virtues are self control yeah. and generosity. Yeah. And actually the, the original word is liberality. So that's what it means to be a liberal actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay <laughs> well i mean i just they were saying in the course of in the course of that ethics discussion that there was no such thing as you know genuine or, or you know sincere genuine yeah gen, genuosity generousness yeah. benevolence yeah, or whatever because in the end it is always self-serving and you know of course i disagree so <laughs> mother again that destroys the mother bond yeah i mean that's where you learn mm -hmm. the kid matters more than me mm -hmm. i mean i remember having these images in my head these fantasies where i try to anticipate throwing myself in front of a train right my kid would be saved right mentally so preparing I'm yourself for that yeah that had the they just don't get it alicia and it and it's because they don't get it, they destroy it, right? I mean, it really I started the car. And that's the pragmatism. What? Since and that is not is useful for them, it doesn't matter. Even though it is a possibility, even though it is an option for some, since it doesn't matter for them, then it doesn't matter at all. Not only that. What about its usefulness to having a coherent society? Right? They just they don't think it's needed for a coherent society. Well, they Everybody, don't they don't think about it at all. Yeah, I don't they I don't think they try to understand it. No. They don't see any reason to see why it would make sense. They don't, you know, there's no no, they're just purely using their Apollonian reasoning, which is detached from emotions. Yeah. Right? I mean, maybe some of them were married and maybe they weren't. Maybe they had kids, but it didn't affect their thinking at all. And see, we actually we were talking about this um, in one of William James's lectures about the will to believe. Yeah. And he, and uh, he said, Are you about any judgment that you make about an idea from comes from how you feel about that idea. Right. Okay. So that's your emotions. Any type of emotional association or how you have experienced this idea in the past, you developed a certain feeling that established an opinion about the idea. And that is what you base your judgment on. But there's still people who think emotion doesn't have any place experience doesn't really matter all that much but so. he doesn't say there are better and worse emotions no like why do people vote for trump because it makes them feel good right why do people do why did people vote for hitler i mean you can't even pass the hitler test mm -mm. And because you think it's useful, because actually he gave them money, right? He stole the money from the Jews. And mm -hmm. I mean, these guys, right? In the shadow of World War II, they're coming up with a philosophy that justifies the Nazis and they don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. I just, it is so hard for me to see how our nation became today what it is based on where it began you know I, I, just, know. I just okay 
I was just teaching in the world philosophies, right? I don't know. We can even look at the documents if you mm -hmm. want, but our, do you, let's see. Do you want to look at this one about humanism and anti -humanism? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh yeah, I was going to actually, um, yes. since nobody else is coming and we can just talk for a while. Um, okay. I'm going to close that. This, okay. Okay, so I, last time we were talking about humanism versus anti-humanism. Um, so after 9-11, um, the fundamentalists said, God allowed this to happen because uh, the pagans, the abortionists, the feminists, and the gays were taking over the country. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's why God allowed it. Okay, right. so since then, Jerry Falwell, <coughs> Jerry Falwell Jr., he started, Jerry, the senior, started Liberty University. Oh, I know where you're part. And his you're son are. was on the board. His son is a very greedy real estate guy who gave all of his buddies contracts to build these huge buildings on the campus. And then he starts having these uh, sexually promiscuous, you know, sort of orgies at swimming pools and finally got kicked off the board. Like he's a corrupt SOB, his mm -hmm. son. And Billy Graham's son is a, is a nasty SOB, all right? And so they, you know, that always happens. You find a scapegoat in the other guy, and then you can get away with all this crap. Anyway, and then this one, you're supposed to be nice to the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians and the Methodists. That is who our founders were. Yeah. 85 of the signers of the, of the Declaration of Independence were Episcopalian. Okay? Yeah, the people who came over, like, They were intellectuals. Right. They, they were people the who decided they weren't going to remain Catholic, but they were still branching out in all of these different faiths that that the, you know, Lutheranism, I guess, kind of prompted. Luther prompted, I guess. Yeah, I started the Protestant Reformation. Yeah. So, I mean, our country was the pro-diversity pluralistic, enlightenment, science-based, progressive, separate church and state, a bunch of humanists, Christian humanists who were called atheists. Some of them weren't even Christians. They were Unitarians, meaning that they didn't think Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, they were raving progressives who declared war on their own country, who rejected everything they were raised with, who were as anti-patriotic as you can get. They were traitors, but they were intellectuals. Mm -hmm. I mean, and now we have these guys saying, you know, I hate them, you know, they're the anti-Christ. And it's the ones who have belief means to accept things without evidence that are now the majority of Americans, okay? Mm -hmm. Our founders did not want a Christian nation. That's what caused all those wars in Europe. They were vehement about it. Okay, so that's actually John Locke. Let me, uh, I guess I'll go back because the reading for today in the class has a lot of that stuff in it. Okay. But, um, I think um, I did oh, a lot I, of thinking about while you're while you're pulling that up I've done some thinking about you know the fathers didn't want a Christian nation but they did want a nation where faith was important and people's faiths were allowed they didn't I don't think they were like anti-god no, or no, anti-belief actually, actually they were pro-virtue and if yeah, you go back yeah. to the world if you go back to this world philosophies and you go to the second lecture on Confucianism, mm -hmm. um, they, they started these virtue clubs 
and they liked Confucius Analects. And yeah. that they wanted people to associate virtue with humanism and you want you need to be virtuous when you're acting as a citizen. And so you might have learned your virtues in your church, but you can separate those from your particular doctrine, right? Yeah. You're not virtuous because you're a Presbyterian, even though you learned your virtues in the Presbyterian church. Right. You have to learn how to separate so mm -hmm. that every denomination promotes the virtues. Let's just talk about Confucius for a while, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, that's, and I'm sure that's what you liked about that class because that's yeah. basically what happened. But I thought of you when I read the first paragraph here, mm -hmm. um, freedom, conscience, and rational inquiry are compatible with the practice of Christianity or even intrinsic in its doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember um, growing up, I thought I was going to go to hell if I didn't Hold on, let me mute my thing because the dog's working. I thought, I really did think that I was, that God was going to be mad at me if I didn't develop my capacity for philosophy, right? And develop my talents. There's a quote in First Corinthians, you know, different gifts, the same spirit. So I had exactly the opposite sense of guilt, right? <laughs> So I think you think that, Alicia, you're supposed to develop your talents, right? Yeah, I think you're supposed to develop them. And um, anyway, so let's see. Let me just start out with the narrative. He came of age, you know, during, oh gosh, where are we? Google Docs. Um, during this period in British history, and um, they went, okay. Okay, so here's what I was gonna ask the students. All right. Do you believe that every one of us was born free and equal and we have a right to equal right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, so Locke said, we're born free and equal, and we have a right to life, liberty, health, and possessions. <laughs> okay, so our founders, uh, you know, uh, changed, changed it. Um, do you agree that if somebody violates your rights, if they take your stuff or they, they don't let you act freely, right, that you have a right to fight back? You have a natural right to fight back. Okay, here's the next step. Yeah, I'm not sure if I agree with that or not. Okay, good, because here's the next step. If you're rational, you know that if everyone, that people misjudge in their own case. So if one person gets hurt, they overreact, and then that person overreacts. So a rational person knows that the state of nature quickly falls into a state of chaos because people are overreacting. So if everyone exercised that natural right, we'd have chaos. And so a rational person wants their right to life, liberty, health, and possessions to be protected. They're acting in their self-interest, their material self-interest. They will, it's more rational to give over that right to a standing body of laws right? But those laws are made by elected officials whose one duty is to protect their rights, right? And the laws have to be created to protect their rights. 
and the laws have to be administered, applied in ways that protect their rights. And if any political leader um, violates, they only have a right to protect people's rights, right? If they take that authority that the people have entrusted in them and create laws that that increase their wealth or power at the expense of the people. They have no right to do that, right? That's an abuse of power. And if they do that, the people have a right to either replace them with a new leader, or if they won't step down, to um, remove them by force. People have a right to remove a corrupt leader by force. So when the leaders become tyrants, they abuse their power, the people, the power reverts back to the people. It doesn't revert to individuals. It reverts to the people and the people replace a bad ruler with a ruler who will rule to protect their interests. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Um, not everybody thinks about politics that way, right? That is socially constructed. Does that make sense? And so we keep projecting our political philosophy onto other people, right? And we invade them or we try to control them or whatever. And their countries are totally different. The way they think about stuff, their history, everything. So, but we're, we're really stupid because we, this is so natural to us, right? As Americans, because of the conditions under which the United States was founded, right? It was this frontier, this blank slate, and we had a right to, um, the other thing was, I have a right to life, liberty, health, possessions, happiness. I have a right to seek my own well being um, to freely and equally, right? And then his view of property that God gave us the earth for us to, again, use our reason and cultivate the land and give it value and then exchange with other people. God wants us to do that. That's the rational thing to do, to work hard, become prosperous, all right? That's called the Protestant work ethic. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. But, but I, mean, I, don't, I don't agree with it. I don't think that humans gave the land value. I don't think it made it more valuable than it already was. It simply, I don't know, used the land's capabilities, I guess, you know? It justified killing off the Native Americans though. Yeah, it did. Because they were lazy and they weren't giving it value. And so God wanted them to either get converted or killed. Okay, they really believe that. All right. Um, then, so, so he envisioned, he has this Newtonian mechanics thing where uh, everything in motion stays in motion unless there's friction, right? Applied to it. So he has these free and equal little monad people, right? These rugged individualists. And um, the, the goal is to keep them, you know, as in motion as possible, but every once in a while there's friction, right? Somebody violates somebody's rights. And so when you have, you start to control the motion, then you have to justify it, right? Because overall this will maximize freedom and equality, right? Maximize everybody doing what they want in order to prosper however they think is prosperous, all right. But John Locke did not want money, okay? Because money makes it 
leads to inequality. So as long as you have a barter system and everybody's using the land to create products, somebody makes candles, somebody makes shoes, somebody makes um, lamps, somebody makes you know, food, whatever, but they trade, it's barter. Nobody can hoard anything or it'll rot, right? And then he said, but, but money got invented. And now the, the owner can hold out, right? And the, the one without money has to compromise, right? The one with money can take advantage of the one without and can centralize the power and there won't be a middle class. So I, I think Locke's top priority is a middle class. But this is where the people in power, especially the Supreme Court right now, is obsessed with going back to the original motives of the founders, the original meanings of the founders, okay? And would there you, was- Would you say that Locke, okay, yeah, he wanted, he was promoting a middle class, but he wasn't, in favor of an upper class, it seems like he thought everybody should be in that middle class category. As free and equal as possible, right? And the way inequality occurs is because of money, right? Everybody should be working, doing what they want to do to become economically stable, trading with other people, but don't have money in there. It'll corrupt the system. Okay, so this is called rugged individualism, right? Everybody is a free equal individual. It's called the Protestant. It's Protestant because Locke, Locke's view of God was consistent with Newtonian science, right? As were our founders. And it's the Protestant work ethic, right? The reason why we can push the Native Americans off the land or kill them if they don't want to get off the land is because they're not working. Yeah, they're we actually talked about the Protestant work ethic in social psychology and how it became a way that we judged other people, how we enforced our stereotypes, you know? So if, you know, so-and-so was poor or starving or whatever, it's because they simply didn't work for it. So they deserve what they got. That's right. It's because they're lazy. And, you know, what I find interesting is that in those classes, you learn it from the detached observer point of view, but I like to teach it from, you think this way, right? You, I want students to actually think that way and just to imagine themselves thinking that way, and then to realize to, to some extent, I do think that way, right? Except that things have happened since then. And so I look around me and I don't totally think that way because there's been some changes. Okay, so let's go to, um, let's go to that line of reasoning, right? Um, the state all people are naturally in is a state of, I got it, I got it, okay. So of perfect equality and freedom, right? There never was such a state of nature. It's purely a, a intellectual construct, right? So it's a state of equality, um, but we also have natural reason. So reasoning is natural. And this goes back to Descartes you know, I have my mind and Kant, and now you have Locke. Locke is an empiricist, however. We have this rational capacity, but for Locke, the object of that kind of calculating reason is the material world. He's an empiricist, right? He was a doctor. He focused on science in terms of studying the natural world. So he's not a dualist at all. His concept of reason 
is calculating the most efficient means to your self-interest and your material comfort and security. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And he also, you know, he said that, um, oh, what was it? There was no scientific evidence of, of, of God and that there never would be any. So, so, so right. he, there was no room in his reasoning for dualism because something that you cannot apply reason to does not need evidentiary support, you know? His big thing, yeah, because if you printed, did you print all this stuff out? Okay, I like print it out too. Um, okay, so it is important to know that Locke's view, the view that we inherited, is based on optimism. He, it depends upon people behaving rationally, behaving in their self-interest. And that's a problem, right, with Americans now. They don't. But the capitalist system is saturating them with advertising that they, sh they should not buy these things. It's not in their self-interest, right? And so capitalism corrupts our reasoning in order to make us consumers and make somebody else money. But can you see how you're taking that same model of rational? So somebody actually, and they do say this, Fox News hosts will say, well, you know, we can't help it. People just want this. There's an appetite for this. And we're just being good uh, Lockean calculators. And we just give them what they want and we make money. So that's rational. Okay, is that what Locke would say? No, I don't think that's what he would say. He would say that's what happens when you have money, right? When money sticks to money. Um, but it is that same calculating. And the owners calculate the means to their self-interest, which is more money. But that's Locke did not want that. He wanted a middle class. But he, he, he seemed, it seems like he was advocating more for a a rational self-interest. Yeah, and, of course. And, yeah, by being reasonable, you kind of self-limit your own interests. You want to live moderately because if you get greedy, like Aristotle said, and they all read Aristotle, greed destroys societies. And so he would say greed is not rational. But what happens is you take that theory and you apply it in a different way and you get raised to do that. So you don't even know it's a perversion of our founders. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And a psychology connection there is, you know, when a person does not have fully developed judgment, I mean, and sometimes we're talking about adults, but generally we're talking about people younger than 25. They, they take higher risks because they assume that, you know, even in the face of statistics and evidence, that's not going to happen to me. And it's kind of like, that's what our nation as a whole has done. Like we see the history, we see what people have written and gone through and done and we just think well that was terrible but that's not going to happen to us no we're the teenagers of the world yeah right? because we are a young nation and so when bush was president i used to go to greece every year and they they just said what are you what are you guys doing like you're trying to set up an empire because that's actually what Mr. Cheney wanted, and that was their mission statement. But most Americans didn't even know that. 
they were, we invaded Iraq because they wanted to set up 134 military bases so we could have cheap oil. And they had set up that goal long before W. Bush. They had set that up under his dad. And his dad didn't let it happen. But then W allowed it to happen. Cheney was basically running the government. But my friends in Greece are going, why is America trying to build an empire? I thought you were democratic. And I had to tell them, actually, most Americans listen to Mr. Bush talk about how religious he is and how he always prays before he ever makes a decision. And then, you know, many of them went, well, that's like the Byzantine emperor, you know, like, and then they go, oh, America is a young country. It's like, we have to make every mistake that they made in Europe. We're not gonna learn the lessons. Well, how many kids know anything about history, you know? They don't, I mean, we're arguing about whether you should, should include African-Americans. What about the way they actually learn about our white European founders? They, they learn complete lies about them, right? That they're, they, oh, oh geez. Anyway, so a rational person will want to preserve himself. And also if you're rational, you want to preserve other people, right? Yeah. Because you like, you're identified with them, right? Okay. So he, and then Locke was also, he believed in God, but in a very generic way, deism, um, the creation of an omnipotent and infinitely wise maker, uh, were sent into the world according to his plan to do his work. Um, we uh, and we should live for our own well-being and other people's well-being. Okay, um, let's see. I, we already went through this. Oh, the right to property. Um, okay, I you can read through that. I think I'm going to go back to that other outline. Some of these things sort of repeat themselves. Um, let me go to, oh geez, okay. Let me go to, um, I think this outline is, no, I don't want that. I want this one. Okay, the model of human rights. Um, all right, so do you, as a philosophy major, um, you also study um, the blank slate, right? So he's, you don't have to read that essay about excerpts from his essay on human understanding, but he's rejecting a bad reading of Aristotle that has innate ideas. And he says, all of our ideas go back to our empirical experience. And we should, we should never try to have ideas that detach themselves. So he's rejecting Kant, I mean, is and and Descartes completely, right? He's an empiricist. He's focusing on the facts, the material reality. Um, okay, let's see. God gave us the earth. Um, all right. Okay. Religion. He didn't want any atheists because they can't be trusted to tell the truth in court. It doesn't matter what religion you are, as long as you believe in God and immortality, because then you'll behave yourself. Um, okay, so marriage. Um, so Alicia, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so marriage. Now we have people are by nature free, equal, consenting. So marriage has to be in so much as it is a civil ceremony. So he's separating the civil ceremony based on two free, equal, consenting adults versus the religious ceremony, right? where that's not necessarily equality. That's whatever each denomination wants to think it is, right? 
If you think God put them together, fine. Say that in your church ceremony. But we're okay. going to have. Was he the first to make that distinction where, you know, marriage was not necessarily like a sacred bond or union? Well, he's saying marriage from the point of view of the civil magistrate, right? I mean, it could be the same person who thinks it's, but when he's acting in his capacity as a citizen. So his letter concerning toleration is just obsessed about here's how you think as a citizen. Here's how you might think in your church, right? I don't care. <laughs> he himself was a heretic, right? He didn't, he was a deist. You can think anything you want over there, but do not bring it in to the public realm. In the public realm, free, equal, consenting adults, right? What do you consent to? You consent, you give up your right to your body, right? To the other person. So you consent to allow uh, physical intimacy, right? So what happened was there was no rape within marriage. There was no any kind of physical abuse. You gave over the right. And so it wasn't until 1995 that a married woman could claim that she was raped by her husband. But that goes back to this, right? I have a right to my life, liberty, to my body, Right, but when I sign that marriage contract, I give over that right. Okay, you have, he even allowed for divorce, which is outrageous. I mean, these guys, any conservative religious person was saying, ah, you're just an atheist. You're, you're one of those awful, awful people that Pat Robertson talked about, right? Those Episcopalians, those, you know, Methodists, those mainline church, SOBs, yeah, that's our founders, that's locked. Divorce was okay, right? But if you're rational, you will never divorce until your children are economically self-sufficient. Is that what we do now, Alicia? No, not even close. Right, but Alicia, the point is, it's based on an optimistic view of human beings and what they will do. And a lot of the problems we have is people do not follow what he would call basic rationality, which is necessary to be a citizen in a democracy, right? Um, it's rational to want to have children. Children are your property. There were no children's rights, okay? Um, the husband and wife have equal right to rule. This was completely outrageous. You know, it's not in the Bible. Um, uh, the husband works. Oh, this is another one. The husband works outside of the home. So he has the right to the fruit of his labor, right? Nobody has a right to take what I worked for, right? So the wife worked at home. So if they divorce, she has no right to take the fruit of his labor. But if she's a good mother, the children will provide for her. Right? <laughs> she has no right to work. She has no right to her own property. But hey, she poured her labor into her kids. They'll give back for her, right? Again, for many, many years because of this way of thinking, there was no alimony, right? There was no, um, women just were left on the street if they did divorce. So of course they don't, they have a lot of motive to stay married even if the guy is pretty awful and he rapes her and it doesn't matter. The children, okay. Rational people support their children. The goal of parenting is to raise children to be free and equal and economically self-sufficient. This thing is all about money, all right? Um, when they grow up, they have to realize that their own security and the protection of their property depends upon the political system. And so they agree to abide by the laws 
because it's in their material economic self-interest, right? They're safer that way. They're more stable that way. And nobody's going to take their stuff, OK? So they have to consent to that. Then they can inherit property. OK, a society is an association of free and equal adults. People can associate with whoever they want. All right. Is education a right? Not according to Locke. And that's where our Supreme Court and our country is going, that you don't have a right to education, right? And you don't have a right to health care. Now, and there, that's the founders. The founders didn't think you had any right. You don't have a right to decent housing. You don't have a right to anything other than the protection of your material goods, right? Why yeah, did if without a right to education, then how does a person become rational and reasonable? You know, how did Locke become able to make his models and his treatises? Well, that's, you know, this is the Achilles heel. Um, and that's why when he came to America, this really took off. Because people, what I think, people could be middle class. They didn't need an education. They didn't need the kind of health care that we have. They built their own houses, right? It worked in America because America historically was closer to this. You could have this minimal government, rugged individual ideology set of ideas and still have a middle class. Nowhere else in the world is that true. Plus, we had slaves, you know. Oh, a little bit of an exception there, you know. But still, it's still stuck in our heads because it worked, according to, you know, white folk. Oh. Anyway, so what happened is things changed. Wow, we're not an agricultural society anymore. We became industrial. Now we're high tech. In order to be middle class, you have to have an education, right? In order to not go bankrupt, you have to have some uh, health care paid by the government. The most common source of bankruptcy before Obamacare was unexpected health care costs. Now, you know, it's true if you don't have a right to health care, well, you just get sick and die. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and why don't we do that? There are people who think that's fine um, because you don't have a right to health care. I want to pay my taxes for your health care. You make your own job. You save your own money. You pay for your own education, kids' education. You pay for your own health care. You pay for your own house, right? But we don't build our own houses anymore. <laughs> okay. But the idea was... Not only that, but there was no minimum wage. There was no occupational safety and hazards. The whole business community used to be buyer beware, right? You bought the product, you live with the consequences. Mm -hmm. Or you signed the contract for the job, you do the job, right? Mm -hmm. You consent. But with no minimum wage, and all that stuff is socialism, all that stuff is government interference it's not what the founders intent you know said and that's where the supreme court is going right um the purpose of the law is per, per, it's only protect the right to life liberty which means you know corporations freedom you know we want to be free we don't want you know so the freedom uh, faction of the Republican Party is is obsessively anti laws that have any the corporations they don't want any restrictions right um, so right to life liberty health and and that's just you being healthy you know it's it's nobody else can poison you it's not that if you get sick you have a right to have taxpayers pay for your Healthcare, not at all. Does that make sense? Is somebody 
undermines your health, you have a right to get them arrested. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it makes sense. But you know, we moved from a society where we all kind of were interdependent, you know, this barter, I have a certain skill that you need to where we're all dependent on the government unless we're wealthy um, or, you know, not stuck in lower middle class or impoverished conditions. We're also highly specialized. Yeah. So yeah. the jobs require such a degree of specialization that everybody truly depends on everybody else. Mm -hmm. I can't fix my own car, right? Mm -hmm. I can't fix my own computer, right? I mean, we are extremely interdependent and yet we're moving backwards into this concept of rights mm -hmm. where we're rugged individuals. It's a complete mismatch. But, but how, how could we fix where we have gone wrong? How could we make those corrections without going back and starting over? Well, what do you mean go back? Well, I mean, like, I mean, if we, to go so, forward, to go forward, that if you want a middle class, you're gonna have to fund K through college education. Right, right. And it's gonna have to be everybody pays some taxes and you have a decent public system because otherwise you're gonna have an entrenched impoverished class that is not gonna be qualified for any of the jobs that pay any even lower middle class income. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just, you can't move backwards. You got to move forward. Right? Yeah, that's, I guess, I guess that's kind of what my question is. How are we going to convince these people that, you know, this is what needs to happen? I mean, that it's just amazing. And they're very smart people. And there's a whole pipeline. Uh, the Federalist Group, it's a group of people that just keeps beating on the minimal government, but they're rich white people, you know, they live in the suburbs, they get good, you know, they're protected. And, um, and they, and they also use it as this is back to our founders. And it's just, it's my view is that John Locke was a lot more worried about a middle class in order to preserve democracy. And he would be willing to say, no, no, you know, we do need taxes and, and education because yeah. middle class is what's important. We did invent money, right? I mean, if you really want to take it literally, I mean, it's like, what kind of sports car would Jesus drive? Like, how far back are you going to go? Yeah. You know? And it's just, it's a very similar thing. Like, we don't, we don't live in that world anymore. Mm -hmm. it, and, um, you know, poor people need computers and cars in order to have jobs, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's just all sorts of stuff that you, you have to adapt it. That's why we have a case law right. system. Right. But again, we have six out of nine Supreme Court are originalists. They want to go back to original intentions. And, um, and I, that's, I get what you're saying. Locke's original intentions would be different in today's age. I think so. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. He would not have said you don't need an education because you obviously do now. You know, because you who can't fix your car can't trade with me who can. By, by giving me something that you can do. Yeah, right. so in order to come up with the money to pay me to fix your car, you have to have an education. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Bill Gates, right? He needs someone to fix his car, but he doesn't have anything to offer. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, anybody with the upper middle class job specializes in a way that no car mechanic could care less about, right? Right. It, yeah, it, and so we did have to invent money because these things were not, we couldn't barter anymore. It got too complicated. Mm -hmm. But lock system doesn't work with money, right? Yeah. It, 
you've got to figure out now you've got to start having a forced redistribution of wealth if you're going to have a middle class once you invent money because money sticks to money and so you've got to fight back against that if you want a middle class when when was currency developed um or is he just talking about like a national currency well, there was money in england yeah it's just that america was the great enlightenment experiment it's the garden of eden yeah there wasn't an american currency and he was saying we don't want one yeah like, there okay probably was one but he's just saying if you really want a strong and stable middle class just keep it out of the system yeah right mm -hmm. or minimize it or just something um and Aristotle's afraid of greed. Are you, do you have class now? No. Oh, that's right. It's, it's a, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't have another class. Okay. If you don't mind, we will talk this through and I'm recording it. And the other students can at least get a recording of it. Is yeah, that that's fine. That's fine. Um, because all this stuff is important, right? Because it really is affecting the way people think. Mm -hmm. It's affecting um, our political system a lot. So, um, so there is this, I mean, it's just very schizophrenic. Sometimes the politicians will appeal to the principle of the thing, even if, if you look at the calculation and go, but that's, you know, when boots on the ground, well, the principle, you can buy a gun whenever you want. That isn't what our founders meant. And freedom, whatever. But as a matter of fact, it costs the society all this money, just plain old money, right? People die and these kids are left without parents or all this healthcare damage or all this other damage. You know, it's, you can have some regulations, right? So when the Democrats suggest uh, background checks, all that stuff, they have a cost benefit analysis. The consequences of this are less cost to society, fewer people falling out of the middle class, right? Fewer murders, whatever. So they're promoting human well-being by having some regulations. And that's the way the Democrats always, they, they are evidence-based, right? Why should we have this teenage pregnancy program in Texas? Why should we have this government-funded program to teach sex ed, to make contraceptives available? Why? Well, because if they get pregnant, they can't get jobs, they, they fall into poverty, it costs society just materially a whole lot, right? And so, so it, I mean, the irony here is that in a sense, the Democrats think more in terms of calculating, not just self-interest, but the consequences for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, the Republicans who want minimal government, it's the principle of the thing. It's the principle of keep the government out of my life. That's what our founders wanted. And that only leads to an entrenched wealthy class and an entrenched poor class. And that is not what our founders wanted. Okay, does that make sense to you? Yeah. It's confusing though, right? <laughs> And any politician can really mess with your mind. To this get... this stuff makes a hundred percent more sense than Descartes, so we're good. <laughs> well, actually, I was. I mean, I'm always <coughs> fascinated by how the students don't mind it. You know, yeah. they 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 go along with the lecture, and um, they come up with questions. They have ideas. They even agree with it. You know, some. And um, yeah, so I, anyway, my main point is always that it's influential, mm -hmm. um, whether or not they care. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, no, this would make sense because this is what we've been saturated with. People right. refer to it, they use rights language all the time. But if you really start sorting this out, 
you're going to get freaked out about why it's not working very well, right? Mm -hmm. So just for one example, um, ever since 1980, the only real party platform the Republicans have is cut taxes. That's a minimal government, right? Mm -hmm. Our founders. So, and all it has ever done is blown up the deficit every time. I mean, it's just like, okay, I'm gonna go out, buy myself a new car, buy myself a new house. I'm giving some people jobs, ain't that great? Mm -hmm. And now I have this huge debt, but now we're all more prosperous. Are we really more prosperous? That's mm -hmm. fake, right? But yeah. that's exactly what happened. They would cut taxes every, oh, yay, happy days are here again. People bought junk, got into debt, the country got into debt, mm -hmm. right? And there was a collapse. Then the Democrat takes over and tries to do all this cost benefit stuff and stabilizes, does not produce that amount of debt at all. It's the Democrats that have been fiscally responsible, even though the Republicans, fiscal responsibility. No, they're not. Then W. Bush cuts taxes, the deficit blows up, the economy crashes because of lack of regulation, right? He cut all these regulations. That was the direct cause. You can trace it straight to lack of regulation. The big oil blow up in the Gulf, uh, British Petroleum, it, you could trace it exactly to the cut in um, a regulation where they had to do something in two different ways. And the Bush administration cut one of those ways and that's exactly how the thing blew up. Okay, so, so um, and then the Republicans did it again with Trump, you know, keep that government, I, I, I don't wanna pay taxes, right? And the deficit just blew up again because people, I'm sorry, you don't want taxes except that you do want healthcare, you do want education, you do want this stuff. It's just that the quality gets worse and worse. And most of the taxes are cut on the rich, not on you. Mm -hmm. But it works, right? It works to get elected. It does not work to create a middle class. Mm -hmm. And it does not work to preserve a democracy. Because when it's unstable enough, people are going to look for some strong man who's going to save them from this because they cannot, they're too fear driven and they've been miseducated. They can't think it through when they try to think about it. Their thoughts get all, you know, cut taxes, you know, is a solution. It's just, they've been jerked around and that, so I, my animosity is toward those, um, money-driven, power-driven, smart, educated, corporate, you know, trained in advertising, trained in marketing, trained in manipulating people who are so cynical and they, you know, they don't care. Anybody who had a chance to do this would do this. But lock system is based on um, belief in people that they will act rationally and we're not acting rationally mm -hmm. and so that's why Hobbes comes back right Hobbes thinks people are totally irrational so they need this strong man mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what he does he's right whatever he does because he maintains order so that's where we're headed does that make sense yeah it makes sense and, and once again I know that this thought probably is not original to me but going back to my first psychology class when there is an issue that hasn't been supported or completely discredited on either side the truth is usually somewhere in between and it's like with Locke's and Hobbes with Locke and Hobbes it's somewhere in between you know people aren't can't be counted on to always do the good thing or the rational thing or the reasonable thing but you also can't just assume that they're going to be this 
base civilization with yeah you know it's somewhere in between and you've got to have a government that can operate in both avenues you know i know and that's so, why you have to watch out because the rhetoric mm -hmm. is each side accuses the other of being extreme mm -hmm. but that's not true no i mean you, you do look at what laws are actually being introduced and it, we get i mean it's unbelievable the habit people have of thinking in abstractions right mm -hmm. but you know what the word right you know, to say that we're born free and equal, that's a complete abstraction, mm -hmm. right? And the notion of rights, what's a right? It's exactly that. Does yeah. that I mean, I think that we are born equally human. I, I don't think that we're all born equally, I don't know, with the same potential, I guess, you know? Yeah, right. We have the same instinctual drives. To right. Serve, but we have different intellectual capacities as we evolve. That's why liberal arts education, you get exposed to a lot of different people with a lot of different talents and interests. And, and then, so, yeah, Locke was thinking about people like himself <laughs> being, and I get what you're saying. He's saying, yeah, you know, well, why wouldn't we do the reasonable thing? Because not everybody has that developed reason. And especially if they don't have a right to education, they're not ever gonna develop it. So, yeah. Yeah, no, no, it was one group of privileged white guys against another, mm -hmm. right? And the ones who came over here were gonna have more power and privilege than they had, you know, but some of them really, it was on principle. It really was the enlightenment. They really thought God gave us a chance to experiment with democracy. They really were more humanitarian. They really did want to try and establish middle class. They really hated Europe where God was used to uh, promote this entrenched wealthy class mm -hmm. that were wicked and they could get away with it. And the king and his kids were a bunch of wicked SOBs. You know, and the aristocrats, I mean, there were a lot of really well intentioned people. And it makes perfect sense that they thought that God, you know, suddenly allowed this to happen to, you know, to make good on science and make good on all this stuff and all this good intentions. Um, but, you know, it's so interesting to think our founders might have thought you know this is divine intervention there's not a you know it's not like we're not supposed to do science just every once in a while it just seems like everything comes together right mm -hmm. i have that the, a couple of those memories in my life where i don't know if there was some you know i don't have a hotline but it just things converged in a way that mm -hmm. was just like it just changed my life and all I know is I'm grateful for it, right? I don't worry about, you know, knowing hotlines to some God. I just know that was a watershed and I'm very grateful. I was very vulnerable and I managed to get out of it, right? Mm -hmm. So I can see them even using reason, just saying this is an amazing convergence, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, then it gets manipulated and cynical people come in there and the Native Americans get pulverized and somebody brings in slavery, which these people wouldn't have wanted slavery, mm -hmm. right? But somebody can do it, manipulates the system, threatens not to join the club. And so it gets corrupted and corroded. And then the irony is that at 9-11, why are we hated by Arabs because of oil, right? If we had just gone green a long time ago, we wouldn't know of a Sunni from a Shia, you know? It's because we depend on that oil. Why do we depend on it? Because people are getting rich on it. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, they're paying for the political contributions. And so our laws are made to promote fossil fuels. That's why they hate us. That's why they went after us. And now, 
Pat Robertson says, God allowed this to happen because our country was being taken over by those intellectuals and those progressives and those people with non-fundamentalist Christian points of view. And, you know, God, the Enlightenment people were promoting women's equality, right? There were people at that time knowing that that's the direction history is going toward women's equality, toward equality of other countries. Um, peoples, I mean, they were, some of them were moving away from racism and sexism at that time, right? And our founders were those guys, okay? And now all of a sudden, those guys, it's just our country is truly upside down from what it was. 180. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I feel sorry for you, Alicia, because you were already outside of the box. Yeah. Now you're really out. <laughs> I'm I'm sending you so far out of the box. I'm like a rocket ship somewhere for poor Alicia. I'm not gonna know what to do with myself. <laughs> I, just, I feel sorry for you. Uh, uh, <laughs> Anyway, so let's see, we did, we did the purpose of government. Okay, so now, um, oh, okay. Here, this, this reading was about understanding, you don't have to read it, but his main point is he's an empiricist, the blank slate guy, right? And, ha, okay, he passed down to us a schizophrenia that we still have. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, he said, a fetus is like a vegetable, okay? Well, if a fetus is like a vegetable, what's wrong with abortion, right? On the other hand, he said, people have to believe in God and the immortality of the soul or they won't behave themselves. Okay, mm -hmm. that's pragmatic, right? That's, mm -hmm. I mean, it'd be interesting. That would be American pragmatism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you could follow that, right? Even James, right? Mm -hmm. If people want to believe that's God, that's fine, right? Anyway, so, um, but if the soul's immortal, well, what, from conception or, you know what I mean? Like this abortion controversy is, right there from the start and it just it just won't go away right mm -hmm. because the right to life absolutely number one the fetus is a vegetable <laughs> right i mean so our country is totally schizophrenic on that one and i think it's interesting that it started out that way and it just keeps going that way right it will not go away Mm -hmm. uh, it's built into the way we think. Um, all right, so there's that. Um, then there's the fact that when he's arguing against innate ideas, that's what the Catholic Church said Aristotle said. Aristotle did not say that, right? So it's a complete misinterpretation of Aristotle which happens a lot when the Bible, right? It's a complete misinterpretation of the Bible, right? It's the same kind of process that an institution has an interest in interpreting the Bible or Aristotle, its doctrine in a certain way in order to maintain its power. And so then Locke and these guys hate Aristotle. They threw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got that. Then you have the letter concerning toleration. Mm -hmm. And I did you go over this outline? I briefly read, I read over that. I don't have notes on it. It doesn't uh, matter. Okay. It's, what was your impression? I don't know. He I think that he takes toleration a little bit too far. If I Okay, for example, using gay rights. I don't think that, I don't know, I think maybe I have to go further back than that. I don't think that you can separate a society 
from faith, whatever faith it's based on, you know, whether it's a, whether it's a Christian America or a Catholic America or whatever, I think that you have to have that religion to have an established country. Does that make sense? And um, so, I don't know. I, values, yes, a lot of, they can be learned outside of church. But when you take your church away and try to leave the values without finding something to replace the church, which strengthened the values, which taught the values, then you're left with values that just get lost and pushed aside and pushed away. Okay. So removing the, removing the church mind from the civic attitude, you know, I think that that's, uh, I mean, it's I, interesting I, though, right? Because this guy, this was our founders really liked this letter, right? Yeah. Now, John Locke did think you had to believe in God and immortality, okay? But the letter concerning toleration really is answering every possible way that that can get corrupted into religious bigotry, right? Right. So he's worried about religious bigotry because that would be the extreme that would be most likely to lead to all sorts of denial of people's rights, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas you're worried about um, uh, secular extremism, yeah. right? Yeah. Like a Methodist counselor that says porn is okay. Like that's, right. that is ridiculous. Yeah, so there's that's no problem with that. It's gone way, way too far the other way, mm -hmm. right? And right. there's, um, there's no balance. There's nothing. There's no common sense. Yeah. Yeah. There's. Well, the other thing about it, Alicia, that's interesting is that you could do, you could do biological studies, right? Of the effect of porn on a body. Mm -hmm. And you could say, this is not healthy. Or you could just look at the effect of a committed marriage you know in general all the data says people are happily married are more stable they're more mentally stable they're more economically stable i mean there's all these biological and social science reasons mm -hmm. to still promote marriage right mm -hmm. and the society has an interest in promoting it now if somebody's an alcoholic you know i mean there's all these exceptions but it's not totally indifferent Right? right. And so having the church promote marriage, having marriage ceremonies is great. Mm -hmm. It's just that when that gets used to discriminate against like gay people or to tell women they shouldn't be equal or to, you know, all that other stuff, the Bible was used for racism to justify slavery. Right. And so, but he's obsessed with what the Bible used to oppress people because that's what Europe was, right? Yeah. And we're gonna have this society where we have equality and don't you dare use the Bible to undermine equality. So here's what it means, right? Um, so anyway, I do think it's interesting though that I would say three quarters of Americans would disagree <laughs> with our founders way of thinking about separation of church and state. Does well, that make sense? No, well, yeah, it makes sense. I think some of some of the aspect of the church made us stronger. It made our relationship stronger. It made our society stronger. Um, because we weren't then just accountable to ourselves and our own self-interest. We weren't then just saying, well, I did this for me, and it's okay that I did this for me because such and such, well, it was reasonable, you know? Actually, Alicia, the way people say, I can do whatever I want, and I have a right to do it, and I even have a responsibility to exercise my freedom and my rights as long as I'm not hurting somebody else. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you calculate whether you're hurting somebody else? right exactly so my mom my mom said 
your freedom, your rights end where another's begins. But she didn't, she wasn't just talking about physical aspects of rights. You know, you can't Kidding. touch their body. Yeah, you can't, yeah. yeah. How are you going to make them feel? What are the consequences of this going to be two days from now, two years from now? You know, it's. Well, what about getting a vaccine? Yeah. All right. Okay. I mean, you can see how people are using this, right? The government is telling me when I can breathe. I don't want to wear a mask. The government is telling me, okay. So this is where freedom and equality, rugged individualism, as long as I don't hurt somebody else, has gotten so complicated that everything you do affects somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. The carbon footprint of the food you eat affects somebody else. Oh, I did a um, mentioning that I, I took like information from my family to see how many earths we would consume, you know, and I think it was like three earths which seemed like a lot to me, but when compared to other people who did it, it was lower than average, but, and yeah, I don't, something like 17, actually. Yeah, I don't take, I don't make a conscious effort to, you know, reduce our waste, but I do more so with energy and buying things that we just absolutely don't have to have, and I mean, I don't, I don't think you should obsess about it because then you're you're wasting mental energy on that. Yeah, well, I just I did it because I wanted. Yeah, uh, we had mentioned it in ethics and I wanted to know. Um, we, we broke into groups in ethics class and did it, but then I went back and did just my family because I wanted to know if it was something I really needed to address. And I guess I am satisfied that I'm doing okay I mean it's not great but you know I'm yeah I mean I yeah. just I just know people whose carbon footprint is just <laughs> um you know they fly in airplanes all mm -hmm. the time and um so it's always a balance but I don't think you should like not drive to school to get your degree because you're driving your car right that oh, would be yeah stupid. no no um but I don't think that I should drive to a different parking lot in between every class. Yeah, right? the kids that yeah. live over at Young House should not drive <laughs> yeah. to class. Yeah. Um, but, oh, geez, what I was going to say. I don't know. Anyway, so this is just, oh, yeah, the notion of what, what harms other people. Mm -hmm. It's just nobody's thinking that through very well right mm -hmm. and then any any taxes that somebody puts on me is harm to me it's a kind of slavery or it's a kind of socialism it's just it's just not you can't you know you want to be uneducated mm -hmm. you want to not have any health care you want to i mean rich people can walk away with everything mm -hmm. and they're perfectly happy as long as you're happy Mm -hmm. um and see oh yeah oh go ahead go ahead oh the thing i was thinking was there's a book about the fact that the food we eat is truly addictive and we have a reaction to it exactly like taking cocaine mm -hmm. okay and it's people are not going to be able to lose weight because they are truly addicted but you know the corporations well this is i'm being rational i'm I'm making money, I'm providing jobs, people can still choose, nobody's forced to eat it. And, and um, you know, people say, nobody can tell me what not to eat. Well, okay, but then you have to go to the hospital because you have, you know, all these health problems or all these knee replacements and hip replacements. Mm -hmm. And who pays for that, right? Right, exactly. And so it's this horrible, horrible, inner way of toxic interconnections mm -hmm. and it's all based on free equal consenting adults 
mm -hmm. being rational and calculating their own economic self-interest and getting people jobs. It's just this little thing money got in there and hey, you know, whatever. But you make a lot of money polluting people's minds, polluting their bodies, telling them, you know, you're not going to be happy unless you look like this or unless you belong to this club, appealing to all these emotions, all these insecurities, all these fears of not fit, fitting in, you know, all this stuff. So in the name of free, equal, consenting adults, you've really got a lot of irrational people on your hands who are not self-governing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this one is about, yeah, toleration and separating, learning how to think like a citizen, like a civil magistrate. Mm -hmm. And he's carving out new space, you know, even in England that had a constitutional monarchy, people did not think in this purely secular way. And so he does want you to believe in, and that's why he wrote a book called The Reasonableness of Christianity. He cites every, every, every uh, fact that's said about Jesus, the, the Mount of Olives, the baptism by John, all this data to say, therefore, we can conclude Jesus was the Messiah. <laughs> well, you know, close. Um, anyway, it, it's a funny link, right, between faith and, um, and reason using scientific method. But somebody else would just say, a Unitarian, I don't think Jesus was the Messiah, but I believe in God. God is the big clockmaker. Mm -hmm. And um, immortality and the last judgment, you know, people aren't going to behave unless they think they're going to roast in hell. So, uh, <laughs> right. And atheists can't be trusted to tell the truth in court. So there's no atheists in civil society. Anyway, so he did have some of that religion, but it's not in this in this document. This and a church free and, and equal consenting adults. Um, each church has its own doctrines. Don't bring that into the civil, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can do whatever you want at church, but when you're acting as a citizen over here. Um, let's see, many of the virtues apply to both civic and religious life, right? That's what we've been doing with Aristotle. Mm -hmm. um, public worship, um, outward forms, you know, everybody should be able to worship, the articles of faith. Okay, anyway, um, that's, that's important for the kind of mindset that was our founders embraced. Um, and then there was, the one other thing was the, the US, the Declaration of Independence, and then the US Locks Declaration, right? So the Declaration said, we have to consider what state people are in, perfect freedom and equality, that's Locke. Um, there's an infinitely wise creator, but we are naturally, no one can, um, can harm us without our own consent. The legislators are governed by laws. The laws have to apply to everybody equally. The purpose of the laws is to protect people's rights. Tyranny is when you're exercising force beyond what you have a right to do. And um, then whenever they destroy, okay. So he has this list, the declaration has this list um, whoever uh, exceeds the power given to him, when the legislators try to, to take away and destroy the people, um, the, let's see, let's see, okay. No, no government can endure long if, um, oh yeah, okay. So the people complaining about Locke were saying, 
people are going to rebel all the time because they're always complaining about power. And he says, no, that's not true. People are not easily broken from their customs. But when there's a long train of abuses, lies, and tricks, who shall be the judge? The people shall be the judge, right? The power that the people gave to their leaders goes back to the people as a whole, and they replace it. Then you have the Bill of Rights. Okay, so this is Locke's, Locke's second treatise, his view of what legitimizes, you know, what's a legitimate uh, rebellion against a government mm -hmm. when the legislative is altered. Exactly, our founders in the Declaration put it in exactly the same order too. <laughs> if you look at when they listed the train of abuses, they started out with the king's messing with the legislative process. Mm -hmm. um, when he introduces, hinders the legislative, it's exactly what they said in the Declaration. When the electors are altered is exactly what they say in the, I mean, it's just amazing, Alicia. And so again, this is the collective mind that established our country, right? Um, okay, so that's what I wanted. I wanted students to just understand that. Yeah. Um, and then we'll, this, this next lecture is all about, well, where are we now, right? Mm -hmm. What is our world like now? Mm -hmm and the way we um, apply these ideas. And it's just, our founders, why did they have a balance of powers? Why did they keep the language vague? Why did they have a case law? Because they wanted a system that would adapt to the circumstances, right? Because the divine right of kings would not. And so you have to throw it out. Mm -hmm. And it's better to have a system that's adaptable, right? Yep. So one of the major differences among judges is, I didn't know this before. Um, I knew the originalists, the, the alternative, the liberals, say that after the Civil War, the third, 14th, and 15th amendments, that's a fundamental shift in our country, in the way we apply those concepts. Mm -hmm. So they would start with the whole judicial decision starting with that, right? And so um, Ginsburg, Ruth Ginsburg, um, it's really interesting how she got women's rights. I mean, it's it, there's a movie about it. It's very interesting because the way that she did it was this guy quit his job to take care of his sick mother. And he couldn't get social security because he was a guy, because it was always women who did that. <laughs> and so what she did was this person is being discriminated against because of sex. That's the only way women got rights, is some guy was getting discriminated against. Oh, but at least she did it. <laughs> Thanks oh. to God, Alicia. If you look at the history, it's just awful. But we're still doing it. We're doing the same thing. That's what really gets me. Mm -hmm. People in power, like affirmative action isn't necessary anymore. Or the, the uh, laws to make sure there were voting rights have all been dismantled because they said, oh, we don't have those problems anymore. And now the states are coming in mm -hmm. and we're having, and still the Supreme Court doesn't, isn't, it's, it's bad. <laughs> oh, I'll just tell you one more story and then you gotta go, but, okay. So this guy was, uh, uh, captain of a girls softball team or something. And he was suing because their team didn't get as much funding as the boys, right? Mm -hmm. It's discrimination after Title IX. Yeah, I'll, I'll let your mom go in a sec. And um, he lost. And Clarence Thomas said to him, 
why are you taking to this court? You're a man. Well, <laughs> because my team, right? They just don't care. It's all self-interest, right? That's crazy. No man would ever support women's rights. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, women would never have gotten rights if there weren't men that supported it, right? Well, I guess he should have told them that, you know, he took them to court because he was fighting for his right to have a winning team, no matter who was on it. Maybe. It's just so bad, especially yeah. since Clarence Thomas, the only reason he's there is because white guys yeah. put him there. Go ahead. Take it and he thinks he earned it and he did not, he was not qualified. It was a very cynical appointment. It was okay that there was a black guy, Thurgood Marshall who died. He worked for civil rights. Mm -hmm. They put in this guy who was a complete anti-affirmative action, uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People is a bunch of whiners. His sister is one of those welfare cheats, which she wasn't. He got to go to Catholic school. She had to go to public school. He was the favored son. He got out of Pinpoint, Georgia. She ended up with kids and her husband ditched her. And her sister took care of her kids for two years and was on welfare. And he's up there saying, my sister is one of those lazy lazy welfare moms isn't that awful that's crazy. i mean how much do they expect a woman to be able to do as a single parent well there's a really good woman who is in the i think the house of representatives from california she was a single parent her name is katie something she okay. went up she had this um hearing in front of Jamie Dimon, who's the head of one of the Chase Bank or one of the, I mean, he's super rich, right? Yeah. And he's not giving loans or he's doing some horrible thing. And so he's, she's, she listed, here's the average rent for a single mom. Here's the food costs. Here's the transportation costs. Here's her income. Okay, Mr. Diamond, how is she supposed to do it? You tell me. Mm -hmm. And he just couldn't. They have no empathy, Alicia. Mm -hmm. You can't have a democracy unless you want to lift people up. Mm -hmm. You can't have a democracy. Mm -hmm. And then your only tool is political rhetoric to make those people feel happy. Isn't that awful? Yep. But I have a right. Do you know why money in politics has gotten so bad? Because the Supreme Court decided corporations have the same rights as individuals. Hey, right, and they don't. Well, that's the decision. That corporations have a right to free speech, so you can give as much money as you want. Um, It's John Locke would not be happy, I don't think. I don't think so either. They knew that middle class was important. And I think they made it a flexible system because they knew industrialization would happen. All this stuff would happen. Mm -hmm. We need a system that adapts. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thanks for listening and talking, Alicia. And I'll see you tomorrow. What are we doing tomorrow? We're not, we, you had Athena and then we had, we were doing the quotes. There were three newspaper articles or four. I don't remember. There were some newspaper articles. Um, actually, I've got them in my bag right here. Let me just, let's. Oh yeah, you can put the boat in there, huh? Um, Oh yeah, the, the economic stuff. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I think most of that is just not a lot of reading. No, they, they were like two or three pages. Oh, I know what we were going to do. The paper on sexist oppression, the outline. Yeah. And yeah. then the paper on conservative women. And then I don't, I mean, 
anyway, because it's because it's a juxtaposition of two positions, right? And each one has partial truth, you know, it's something you really have to wrestle with, right? Mm -hmm. Um so but that's that's a pretty long paper. I don't know if you want to skip that or not. Um no, I mean I need to at least read some more of it. Um if I don't make a whole lot of connections out of it, we can skip it. But I don't want to just completely. Okay. And the other one is an yeah. outline. Yeah. Um, and we may be able to meet longer tomorrow if classes are canceled again. I mean, what's the weather it's, like? It's icing and sleeting. It's like 28 degrees. So, I mean, it was thundering just a minute ago. So if it keeps coming down we're gonna probably not have school tomorrow like my husband's job sent him home and normally they would just tell him to stop driving and make him stay for the rest of the day and work in the yard it's an ice storm basically yeah yeah so if it keeps icing and stuff then it, it could get kind of kind of bad do you mind if we keep having class why no, did get I'm not doing anything. Matt's watching TV on his phone, so he's happy. What, baby? When I was getting off my bus, uh -huh. I almost slipped because the ice on the road. Yeah, it was slippery getting off the bus. Why? Yeah, I yeah. doubt that y'all are going to school tomorrow. That's I, what we I, were talking about. Yeah, I don't think we are. I think we're going on Monday. Because yeah. I changed the chart to 26 uh, for Monday. What is today? Uh, 23. This is Wednesday, so they think we're going to be out Thursday and Friday. So that makes it going to 26. 